Hello, hello and welcome um, to another one of our insightful uh, webinars. I'm Camilla, Sales Executive here at Fit Capital UK and I am joined by EJ from our headquarters in Singapore. Hello EJ. Hi, hi Camilla. So, hi, so we're just going to wait a few minutes to allow the rest of our guests to join us. But in the meantime, and for those of you that don't already know, let me tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, so Philip Capital um, is a branch of the wider group of companies that um, comes under the Philip Capital uh, group. And it was set in Singapore, uh, in Philip Street, actually, in the 70s. So lots and lots of years of experience. The group... Um, gradually became a financial powerhouse in Asia and since 2015 has penetrated the European market with its FX, CFD and commodities desk here in London. If you do want to know more about us, please go to our website. I'd really urge you to do that. I've just projected it here for you. You should all be able to see it. On the website, you'll be able to find more information about us, such as our SCA um, registration number and obviously all of our products. If you do want to know more about what we actually offer, the best way is um, clearly opening a demo account. It's really, really easy. You just put in your name, email address, and in a matter of a few moments, um, you will be able to uh, download our demo and have access to our platform, which will give you access to our spreads in real time. Um, again, you'll get $50,000 of virtual funds for you to practice uh, everything that you will learn in the next 45 minutes. Um, in just a few seconds, EJ will teach us how to master technical analysis in only 45 minutes. So without further ado, I will let EJ speak. Um, just one more thing, EJ, we're very lucky to have him um, here today. He's a business development executive with Philip Futures. And as part of the Forex Bullion Trading Desk, um, he specializes in the development of products and platform to support the trading needs of a full spectrum of clients in Philip Futures. Um, he's conducted numerous and numerous seminars on the platform for clients new to forex trading. So I will let him um, uh, speak and uh, will now learn everything he's got to teach us. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Camilla. <laughs> also, I'm just really glad to have this opportunity to be able to share a little bit with everyone about what I know. So as Kemler has mentioned, uh, in the next 45 minutes, what I'll be sharing with you would be the basics of technical analysis and hopefully everyone will learn something new after this webinar. So moving on just to share a little bit of the disclaimer that we have is that whatever information that will be shared in today's webinar is prepared with ample research to the best of my knowledge, but it does not take into consideration specific investment objectives nor constitute investment advice. So should you decide to trade, do conduct your own research. All right, with that aside, moving on. So the content that will be covered today will give you a glimpse into the world of technical analysis. Now these broad topics which I'll be going through today can be delved into much deeper on your own, at your own time. However, after this webinar, what you should have is possess a good knowledge of the basics of technical analysis, as well as a handle on the topics to explore further. So without further ado, let me just dive in. All right, so the thing to understand about technical analysis before we move into that proper is that there are two main school of thoughts or two main methodologies when it comes to the to analyzing factors that shape trading decisions, right? So the first would be fundamental analysis, which will be the one on the left, which, heavily, which is heavily dependent on macroeconomics factors. So traders that are conforming to this methodology, known as fundamental traders, are always on the lookout on information such as geopolitical events, 
The recent example would be the North Korean and US tension just last year. Reason being that uncertainty and fears tends to cause investors to move their funds. So next would be economic data releases, such as non-farm payroll that is released the first Friday of every month, followed by CPI and GDP data. And of course, the one that has been in the center of interest for this group of fundamental traders will be the central bank interest rates. So as the name suggests, this methodology is highly driven by economic fundamentals. So next would be the second methodology, the te technical analysis, which is our focus for today. So it shapes trading decision of technical traders using price charts as its main, main analytical instrument. So what it aims to do is to understand market sentiments based on historical price movements and use that information to forecast future price movements. So that is how their trading decisions are being shaped. So some of you might wonder, so between the two, which is more superior? But the truth is between the two, no one method is actually superior to the other, but both may become powerful techniques when used correctly. So there are three assumptions upon which technical analysis is built upon. First being that market action discounts everything. So what does this mean? It's that fundamental technical traders, my apologies, despite knowing that price movements are reflections of market reaction to fundamental economic reasons like the one I mentioned previously. However, in this methodology, they deem it unnecessary to understand those reasons in order to plot their charts. And also, as I mentioned, charting is the main tool that they use for analysis. Second assumption is that history repeats itself. So what this means is that uh, human, it assumes human sentiment is reflected in the market action, uh, namely the price action of the market, and that human nature does not change. So by looking at historical chart patterns or chart price actions, it allows for an extrapolation to the future results, shaping their trading decision. And last but not least is that prices move in trend. They tend to move as such. So this means for the tech, what this means for a technical trader is that he can identify possible points of future peaks and troughs in a trend. So this is used to optimize position of entry and exit into the market. Yeah, so these three are the main assumptions that sums up uh, what technical analysis is built upon. So moving into the first um, and important segment would be understanding Japanese candlestick. So pricing charts may exist in various forms, many different forms such as a line chart, a bar chart, or a form that has been so extremely popular to traders known as the Japanese Japanese candlestick. So the reason why it's so highly adopted is due to the information that may be derived from a single candlestick. So you can see on my chart right now, there's on my slide, there's two candlesticks, namely the bullish and bearish candlestick. At first glance, you might not tell the difference, but I'll go into detail shortly. So the three main components are the upper shadow or wick. So uh, this is formed by the skinny portion on the top portion followed by the body of the candle, which is the thickest portion, followed by yet another skinny portion at the bottom of it, known as the lower shadow or wick. Now you notice the two candles, uh, the bullish and the bearish, are marked green and red respectively. So the bullish candle actually indicates a rise in price, and the bearish candle indicates a fall in price. Do note that these candles may vary in color scheme depending on the trading platform that you use. So at a glance, uh, I mentioned there are four pieces of information that can be extracted from a single candlestick. So the four information are the open price, close price, the high and the low price of the candlestick. So notably, the difference in the bearish candlestick is that uh, they have the same high and low point, but the difference lies in this that the opening and closing price is at different position. What this means is actually um, on the bullish candlestick, prices are closing higher than the opening price, whereas in the bearish candlestick, prices are closing lower than the opening price. So that's the difference in both these candlesticks. So I hope this has gave you a little more understanding, a basic understanding of Japanese candlesticks. So moving on, uh, we move into understanding trends. 
So trends is absolutely pivotal in technical analysis because it reveals the general direction where price is likely to continue headed towards until a reversal of such happens, right? So there are three main directions in which uh, prices can move in a realistic scenario. Uh, price can move in an uptrend manner, price can move in a downtrend manner, and of course, price can move sideways, which means in a range, right? So at first glance, it may seem like the three patterns are very obvious. However, that might not always be the case in a real life scenario. So we will uncover what exactly defines a trend. All right, so in an uptrend, an uptrend is defined when higher highs are formed and higher lows are formed. So higher highs are as such as you can see, the newer highs, the, the chart progresses from left to right. So as you can see, the red circle marking out the HH are higher highs. So as new highs are formed, it exceeds the height of the previous high. So that's why we call it the higher highs and higher lows. So which means to say also the new lows that are formed are higher than its previous, uh, previous lows. So you want to be able to see this uh, really easily. So uh, what we do is that we draw a trend line to help us see this pattern really easily. So how a trend line is plotted is by uh, connecting the three lower points. So this is for the uptrend by connecting the three high three higher lows, you can see a trend line is being formed. So as we return to the chart, we may see so uh, clearly that this is an uptrend that is being formed. So next we move into a downtrend. So a downtrend is defined as uh, when lower highs are being formed and lower lows are being formed. So similarly, the chart progresses from left to right. So as you can see, uh, the newer lows and newer highs that are formed are significantly lower than its previous uh, highs and lows. And in the same way, we want to visualize this easily. So what we do is we draw a trend line, right? Uh, connecting three or more high points. So the difference between uh, an uptrend trend line and a downtrend trend line is that in the uptrend, uh, the trend line is con connects three low points, whereas in the downtrend, uh, the trend line connects three high points. So that is the difference to note uh, when you analyze the different chart patterns and the trends in the chart. However, majority of the time, uh, you will realize that price are moving neither in an uptrend nor downtrend, by sideways as such. So you can see prices are not moving significantly in a single direction, but it seems to be bouncing off two extreme bands uh, marked out by the red circle. You can see it, the top band marked out by the three red circles and the lower band marked out by the four red circles. Now, what do I mean by band? It means an area or a point where prices tend to move into. So uh, to visualize this, to capture the range in which prices are moving within, two lines are drawn, one at the upper extreme and the other at the lower extreme. So what this helps us to see visually is that prices are moving within the range highlighted in yellow. I understand this topic is about identifying and understanding trend lines, but I just want to clarify that you cannot call the lines drawn uh, here, a trend line, because a trend line only occurs in a trending market. But right now, this is a ranging market where prices are moving sideways. So this is merely a way to identify that prices are not in a trend, but a range. All right, so that's about trend lines. So moving forward, uh, we will understand a little bit more. We will discover what support and resistance are. So support and resistance, as you may have heard about it before, because this is a, a really key term that technical traders use. Uh, there are key areas of value where prices tend to move toward, right? All psychological levels where buyers and sellers tend to react. What do I mean by react? I mean, those are price points uh, where buyers start to buy and sellers start to sell. So support shown in this MNA, animation is an imaginary flaw that prices cannot go below or cannot break below and a resistance on the other hand in this animation acts as an imaginary ceiling that prices cannot go above or break above 
right? So to better visualize them again, it's all about the visualization. So you would draw the line that connects the point in which prices coincide. Uh, it connects three points, three points at the top and three points at the bottom. So you'll be able to visualize them uh, in, in a clear and concise manner. So however, you will realize that uh, in a realistic situation, uh, this is this might not be possible because only in an ideal situation will the price rally and retrace to coincide so accurately. In most real cases, there will be some variations in where the upper extreme and the lower extreme lies. So this is why it is better to identify support resistance as a zone. So this zone is shown in the animation. So a zone takes into account uh, some tolerance to which uh, the areas of support and resistance are. So uh, personally, I feel that this is uh, something that is more flexible. It helps you to identify uh, better. So if you recall the previous segment, we just talked about trend lines and you realize that it's exactly the same as identifying a ranging market. And so this is because the upper and lower bands are prices are zones where prices tend to retreat into. And this is what support and resistance is about. Remember, we, uh, we talked about it earlier, that support and resistance are prices or psychological level where buyers and sellers start to react. Uh, however, in a trending market, there are various ways to identify support and resistance. So I'll be covering that next. So this is for a ranging market support and resistance zone. So now we move into a trending market. So a trending market is one where prices are moving in a really obvious trend, either upwards or downwards. So ascending and descending channels are one form of support and resistance in a trending market. So to achieve or to mark out this ascending and descending channel, what you have to do is simply draw the usual trend line that we have taught earlier. And on top of that, at a upper band for uptrends and a lower band for downtrends and ensure that both bands encapsulate the range in which prices are moving within. So in, case, in a case like this, you can tell that the lower band uh, will act as the support and the upper band will act as the resistance. So uh, just to recap again, support acts as a imaginary floor where prices cannot go below and Resistance access and imaginary ceiling where prices cannot break beyond. So just like that, as you can see, clearly prices are moving within a range where we can clearly identify. Uh, I will explain later on why it's so important for us to mark that up. So another form of support and resistance uh, that may exist in a range in a trending market is horizontal lines. So likened to a ranging market, it connects three or more points that coincide in close proximity. So what I mean is this, as you can follow the animation, you see four points coincide in the same point. We mark that out with one line, followed by another three. We mark that out with another line. And another two, we mark that out with another line. So that forms a support and resistance. So there's an exception to this uh, two or three more points forming the support and resistance is when the prices are at its upper extreme and lower extreme as shown in this um, animation right because uh, they are automatically taken as a support and resistance because price have reached that point and reversed so however do take note that if the current price is at the highest or lowest point it may not be taken as a valid point of support or resistance because prices have not been fully formed or fully played out, it could go higher or lower. So in this case, in the animation, you can tell that prices has already touched the highest point and reverse. This is why it is validated as a support and resistance uh, respectively. Right. So there's one more way where you can identify support and resistance in a trending market. That would be through the use of exponential moving average. Right. So usually, uh, this method involves a bit of trial and error. The aim of using uh, exponential moving average, which is a technical indicator, is to identify which one does price tend to fall into. So the popular values are 50 EMA, 
100 EMA and 200 EMA. So I said uh, identifying the one in which price tends to fall into. So what do I mean by that? As you can see in the top left photo, uh, the snap that I've taken, prices seem to fall into the red color line, which is the 100 EMA. So uh, that is what we want to see. We want to find the EMA in which price tends to fall into. So we can uh, categorize that as a support where prices cannot break below. So on the right, you can see uh, that prices are falling into the blue color line, which is also the 100 EMA. So we can categorize it as a resistance where price fails to break above and reverses from that point forward. So that is the three ways that uh, you can identify support and resistance in a trending market. So we move on to understanding technical indicators. So there's one thing I want to address about technical indicators. It is a term that is so frequently used by technical traders uh, because for amateurs that are starting out in technical analysis or beginners, what they tend to see technical indicators is as a holy grail. So forming common misconceptions like the use of more indicators will lead to accurate signals and usually set people on this journey to find out that secret or that magical indicator that will give them all the right signals. So unfortunately, uh, this is not true. There is no one magical indicator that can be found. So you will discover in this section that even though technical indicators are important, it is just another piece to a larger puzzle of what shapes a trading decision. All right, so just to give you a background of technical indicator, a technical indicator is a mathematical calculation that is based on historical price. So it measures a specific component of the current price behavior. The aim of which is to predict future price direction. So the top three points are what most people understand and the understanding stops there. But they fail to take into account point four and five, which is really crucial. Right, that it is used as a trigger for entry and exit points. What this means is that it has to work in tandem with the other components to form the larger puzzle, uh, like the lessons we have covered earlier, how to identify trends, how to identify areas of support and resistance. So do remember that technical indicators has to be used in tandem with the others in order for it to be effective. So there are categories in which indicators are classified into. The most, the most common category is known as an oscillator. So some characteristics of an oscillator includes having two extreme bands, just like a pendulum, which changes direction upon reaching its extreme end. It is used to identify turning points. So it is used in conjunction with other tools, as mentioned earlier, to affirm its projected direction. And this section will cover two popular oscillators, uh, at the moving average convergence divergence and RSI. So these are the two that we will be covering. So why are we only covering two? As I mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, uh, the aim is not to cover everything about technical, uh, about technical analysis, but what it aims to do is to give you a good handle on the things to explore right after this. But these two are really popular and uh, be, sure to, be sure to learn more about it after this webinar. So the first one we are talking about is the moving average convergence divergence or for short, uh, we call it MACD or MACD. Both ways are fine as well. So it has two components, the MACD line and the signal histogram. Okay, so if you need to know how their values are being derived, I'll just give a short explanation for those who, who wants to find out about the more technical underlying terms of how it's being derived. The MACD line is obtained by subtracting the 14-day simple moving average by the 26-day moving average, whereas the signal hist histogram simply represents the 9-day simple moving average. So the function really, if you don't understand it, it's okay. You just need to know what's being used for. So the function of this indicator is to identify the strength and momentum of price moving in a certain direction. 
So you may see the image of the arm wrestling match on the left. So it's something just like that. When you observe an arm wrestling match, uh, you can tell who is the stronger contender just by how far the hand is leaning and how fast it takes to reach there. So this is too applicable in terms of price. So as you observe price charts, the MACD aims to do that, help you identify the strength and price momentum, whether is it in an uptrend or a downtrend. Right. So the area marked up by the blue rectangular box is the MACD or the MACD indicator. Across different trading platforms, I just want to say the, histos, the signal histogram may be presented as a line, but I'm showing this with the MetaTrader Meta 5 platform to avoid any confusion. So there are two ways in which the MACD may be utilized. Right? The first being the position of the MACD and signal line with reference to the zero line. So the zero line is the line that is uh, in the ind indicator one third. one third of the box. You see a line there and if you look carefully, you can see four zeros. So that's the zero line. So should both the MACD and the signal histogram uh, cross below the zero line, it means that the bears are stronger than the bulls. Remember this MACD measures strength. So conversely, if both the line, MACD line and the signal histogram crosses above the zero line, it signifies that the bulls are stronger than the bears. Right, so that's the first way you can utilize it. So the second way to utilize it, sorry, so in this explanation, you can see um, that prices, the MACD line and the signal histogram has crossed below that zero line. And so prices have moved downward. And another example marked out by the green uh, rectangle and square, you can see that MACD line and the signal histogram is above the zero line and hence prices are beginning to move upwards. So the second way you can use this is if the signal histogram is larger than the MACD line. This is in terms of height. So if the height of the histogram is taller than the signal line, the si by the way, the signal line is the uh, the signal histogram is the one in grey and the MACD line is the one in red. So if the height of the histogram is taller than the signal line, it means that the prevailing trend is strong. right? And if the histogram becomes shorter than the signal line, it means the prevailing trend is weakening, both for an uptrend and for a downtrend. So I have two examples over here. In the first, you can see that the histogram is slowly reducing in height. Um, initially, it was uh, longer than the, than the MACD line, and now it is uh, getting shorter, and price has reversed as a result. So the second one, it's, uh, the histogram is re uh, it's significantly shorter. So you can see that prices are moving down as a result. So in both these cases, you can tell how um, MACD has identified strength as well as momentum. So it tells you whether the bulls are stronger, the, all the bears are stronger, and it also gives you a way to see if the prevailing trend or the current trend is strong or is weakening, resulting in a reversal. Right. So the next popular os oscillator that I want to cover is the relative strength index, or the RSI for short. Again, mathematically, if you want to know, the way it is obtained is by comparing average upward close to downward close over a range of 14 period. So um, earlier we covered Japanese candlestick and there was the bullish candlestick and there was the bearish candlestick. So the bullish candlestick actually represented an upward close. So why is that? It's because prices closed higher than its opening price. And for the bullish candlestick, prices close lower than its opening price. That's why uh, they are both upward close and downward close respectively. So um, it is compared over a range of 14 period. So this period is in terms of what you have selected. It may be in terms of hours, in days or month, depending on the time frame that you have, used, you have chosen to use this indicator on. So I've attached an image of the speedometer because it measures the speed of change in price over the selected period in time, just like a speedometer, to identify two conditions. 
overbought and oversold, which is the peak and the trough respectively. So remember or recall in the beginning when I shared the three assumptions in which uh, technical analysis is built upon, the final one in trends. So the purpose of this is to identify the peak and troughs so that traders, technical traders can identify point of entry and exit. Right. So that is the two indicators that we have covered. So moving into how do you use RSI? So there are two clear levels to look out for, two key levels. Uh, the first level is 30, which is the bottom black line. Again, uh, the rectangular box marks out the RSI indicator and the bottom black line marks out the 30, 30 level. So that marks the oversold level. And above that, on the higher black line, it marks out the 70 level, so which represents overbought. So if the red line touches or crosses above 70, it has reached overbought condition and could lead to a reversal to the downside. And if the red line touches or crosses below 30, it has reached oversold condition and could lead to a reversal to the upside. So let me just show you what I mean. So you can see here marked out by the two green circles. So prices have touched the 30 level, uh, so which means it is oversold and prices are, prices could uh, reverse, so which is what has happened. And the second one on the far left marked out by the red circle, where price nearly touched the 70 level or is approaching the 70 level and um, has reversed after that. So these two are key levels where you want to look out for. However, one word of caution is that do note in, term, in times of trending markets uh, that are really strong, prices could remain in overbought, overbought or oversold conditions for a long period of time. So this must be used in tandem with other factors. So I can't stress this enough. So uh, whatever I share today, uh, whether is it the Japanese candlestick or is it the technical indicators, all must be used in tandem of whatever we will be covering today. So next we move into candlestick patterns. So just now I really basic form of candlestick, Japanese candlestick. Uh, it's just one form of it. There are various iterations to how it may appear. And so this is the section where I'll be covering it. So other than giving the four main information, open, high, low, and close price. So what you can do is also, it serves as a trigger for traders to enter and exit the market apart from technical indicators. So if you recall in, uh, in the earlier segment, I touched on how um, this may look different. So this is how, this is how it will be like. So candlestick patterns, as I mentioned, similar to technical indicators are not meant to be used on its own. Uh, but it becomes powerful when used with other factors that we have co covered earlier. It becomes a powerful trigger signal. So four types of powerful candlestick patterns I'll be covering today. Uh, they are the doji, the engulfing series, the hammer and hanging man, and the stars series. Right, so the first pattern I want to cover is the doji candlestick. So as you can observe, it is slightly different, it, different in appearance as compared to the candles I have demonstrated in the introduction to Japanese candlestick. However, the information that it provides does not change. Uh, this occurs, a doji occurs in points of indecision between buyers and sellers, meaning uh, both sides are unsure. And so it is formed technically when the opening and closing price are the same. So the shadow or the wicks the thin portion reveals the price fluctuation before the closing of the candle. Right. So in both cases of the long legged doji or the gravestone doji, if spotted near a strong resistance or support, could possibly signal a reversal in trend. So this will be, as you can see, the example on the bottom right hand corner, a doji is being formed at a strong resistance level and from that point onwards price reversed to the downside. So we move into the engulfing series. So there are a few ways to identify these different patterns which I'll be covering later on. So the distinguished features of this engulfing series is that the pattern has to be completed with two candlesticks 
and there are a few prerequisites that must be met. So the prerequisite for a bearish engulfing candle here is when prices are first moving in an upward manner. So after prices are moving in an upward manner, the pattern will begin with a bullish candlestick, uh, which is the one in white, and followed immediately with a bearish candlestick with a body so large, large enough to engulf the previous candle, hence the name engulfing pattern. So this engulfing that I mentioned has to be literal, meaning it's not merely a comparison of length, which is longer, but the position of this engulfing is crucial as well. So it has to take place exactly as seen. So what this price action represents is that the best has overcome the bulls and a possible downward reversal might be set to take place. So on the flip side, we have the bullish engulfing pattern. So everything happens in reverse of the bearish engulfing. The prerequisite now has changed. So initially for the uh, bearish engulfing pattern, it has to begin from a upward moving pattern. So right now it has to, price has to begin in a downward moving manner and it will begin the pattern with a bearish candle, which is the one in black, followed immediately by a large body bullish candle that engulfs the previous candle. So the price action here reveals that the bulls have overcome the best and could be a possible point for upward reversal. So I've been mentioning bulls and bears. So just for the sake of those who uh, do not know what bulls or bears mean, so bull typically means that uh, prices are uh, in favor of moving upwards and bear means that price are uh, tend to move downwards. Okay, so next we move on to the hammer pattern. So this hammer pattern is a one candle pattern. And like the name suggests, it takes on the shape of a hammer, right? With a small body at the top, followed by a long shadow or wing at the bottom. So this has to follow after a series of downward moving candles, bearish candles. After this occurrence, prices tend to reverse in the upward direction. Recall that wicks, I mentioned the candle wicks are price fluctuations before the close of the candle. So in terms of price action, what has happened here was that the bears were trying to push the prices much lower. But as a result of the successful attempt from the bulls to stop it, the candle closed much nearer to the opening price, forming almost a doji, signifying that the bulls is gaining strength over the bears. So prices are uh, set to reverse upwards after this. So um, if we place the hammer, in a series of upward candles instead of downward candles, you get the hanging man pattern. It is same shape to the hammer. It has a small body concentrated at the top, followed by a long bottom wick or shadow. But do know there is a difference. There's a difference in that um, in that the body it, the body is a bullish candlestick, as unlike the hammer, which is made of a bearish candle body. So as you can see, prices are closing higher than the opening price, whereas in a hammer, prices are closing lower than the opening price. So in terms of price action, what this signifies is a large selling off taking place near the opening price, which indicates the loss of momentum of the bulls. And so prices are poised to reverse downwards. And finally, we we'll move on to the last series, which is the star series. So this star series is a three candle pattern. The evening star seems like a common pattern that is formed all the time. But in fact, uh, the prerequisite for this formation is quite specific. First off, it has to take place after a series of upward moving candles. The first, the first bullish candle will begin the pattern, which is the candle in white followed by a smaller body candle that has gapped up from the closing price of the first candle and completing the pattern is a bearish candle that has gapped below the opening price of the second candle. So there is quite a mouthful, that quite, there's quite a lot to pick in. So do bear in mind that this is the pattern or the prerequisite uh, for an evening star to be formed. So after which prices are likely to take a downturn. So the final candlestick pattern that we will be discussing is the morning star. 
So it is the reverse of an evening star. The setup takes place in a series of downward moving candles and it begins the pattern with a bearish candlestick, which is the one in black. So gapping down from there is another smaller body candle, uh, candle bearish candlestick, and then gapping up again into a bullish or white color candlestick. So this completes the morning star. And just like the evening star, this becomes a point of possible reversal from the existing direction, which is upwards. All right, so before I move into the final segment, which is the common mistakes to avoid with technical analysis, let me do a quick recap of what has been covered in this webinar so far. So we went through, we begin with the introduction of technical analysis. It's different from fundamental analysis, how two different groups adopt two different school of thoughts. There is the fundamental traders and the technical traders. Then we talked about three assumptions that technical analysis is built upon. Following which an introduction of Japanese candlestick and the four pieces of information that it provides. After which we move into understanding and defining a trend. We learn how to connect the high and the low points to draw a trend line. And then we identify how support and resistance is formed. That was covered in a greater detail, touching on different ways to define support and resistance when prices are in a trend and when prices are moving sideways in a range. We also went through what technical indicators are in technical analysis, what oscillators are, and the use case of two popular oscillators, MACD and the RSI. Finally, we covered seven common candlestick patterns that can act as a trigger for entry and exit points. Like technical indicators, they are not meant to be used alone, but in tandem with everything we have learned today. So think trend lines, support resistance, technical indicators, and finally candlestick patterns. So when all of these are used in combination, uh, they, are, they are able to formulate a powerful strategy. Okay, so before you embark on your exciting journey of applying technical analysis, there are a few things you must avoid. Uh, knowing mistakes that so many amateurs make could save you a huge amount of time figuring out what went wrong. Right, so avoiding common mistakes with technical analysis. So mistake number one, using every possible indicator available in your trading platform. So this does not only make seeing the price chart impossible, it confuses the trader with all sorts of misleading signal. The result of using a multitude of indicators are for one, receiving many entry signals, and it also displays conflicting signals. So in such a scenario, it becomes extremely difficult for you, the trader, to know which signal to follow and which combination went right or wrong after executing a trade, making it extremely difficult to be consistent in trading. So mistake number two, like I mentioned earlier, an indicator is not the holy grail to successful trading. It cannot be used on its own, but must, be, but must take other factors into consideration, such as the prevailing trend, where the current key support and resistance zones are. And as you can see in this illustration, if I were to sell at every point, the RSI indicates an overbought condition, you will be making a huge loss because prices has reversed uh, in the other direction that we have expected. Uh, so which is why I keep stressing that it cannot be used alone. So mistake number three, getting restless after staring at the charts for hours upon hours, you start to get frustrated and lose the patience to wait for a strategy to play out. You force yourself to see a pattern, even though it does not comply to all the specifications of your strategy. So you see in this, uh, in this illustration, you see this doji candlestick that is forming, thinking that it signifies a reversal from a downward momentum. So you enter the trade, uh, you manage to make a small profit initially, but not long after you realize you are deep in the rate or you are losing money. Okay, so with that, I wrap up the three mistakes, common mistakes that amateur makes with technical analysis. And so with these three mistakes exposed, I hope none of you fall prey to it. Do always keep them in mind while exploring technical analysis. Finally, I leave you with a quote from Zig Ziglar, a famous motivational speaker, success occurs when opportunity meets preparation. So once again, I thank you for tuning in and I hope everyone has learned something today. Thank you. Thank you, EJ. And with this beautiful slide and quote, we have come to the end of the webinar. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. I, for one, have taken a lot from the webinar, and I'm sure that all of our clients, whatever the knowledge level they're at, have learned a lot from it. Again, to all of our guests, please feel free to send any questions or comments you may have at support at philipcapitaluk.com. We will obviously answer as soon as possible. And last thing, when the webinar will end, you will have the chance to take part in a quick survey where you'll have the opportunity to tell us what you thought and tell us what topic you'd like us to discuss in the future. So don't miss that opportunity. And don't forget to visit our website to see our blog and current promotions, download a demo and practice all that you've learned from EJ. Thanks again, EJ, and have a lovely day.